This is Valley View News, and here are today's headlines. More than 80 people were arrested during a protest in St. Louis. Insane Clown Posse fans protested in Washington. Gas prices are through the roof after Hurricanes Irma and Harvey. Hi, welcome to Valley View News. I'm Amber Partita. And I'm Dahlia Perez. More than 80 people were arrested during the protest of the acquittal of ex-police officer Jason Stockley in St. Louis. Stockley was found not guilty in the killing of Anthony Lamar Smith. The incident occurred back in December of 2011. Protesters attacked law enforcement by throwing chemicals and rocks at them. They also broke windows and flipped over trash cans. Protests erupted Friday in downtown St. Louis after the acquittal of Stockley was announced. Protesters say they want to achieve one goal, and that is to end the killings of black citizens. On the other hand, police say they are in control and will protect the city. Fans of the band Insane Clown Posse, who are known as Juggalos, rallied in Washington, D.C. last Saturday. They protested because of the FBI classified them as gang members. So-called Juggalos claim they've been profiled by law enforcement, discharged from the military, and fired from their jobs for being fans of the band. They said their focus is on community and family, and the gang designation isn't what their culture stands for. The band sued the FBI over the classification in 2014. The suit says the Juggalos are a family of people who bond over music. Due to the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey and Irma, California gas prices have increased this past week. Valley View News reporter Chris Escobar has more. The California gas price was raised five cents due to the two powerful hurricanes hitting the southern states. One resident believes it's a habit for gas prices to increase after a major disaster. Well, I mean, just that's what happens when disasters happen where the, a lot of oil is produced down there. And I understand there's going to be a little uptick in oil prices. With the five cent increase, some gas station employees say it's America's duty to help out other states when going through a tough situation. I think it is like, you know, um, Americans is a citizen's responsibility all around America to help out whenever there's a hurricane, you know, because they do need help. The average cost for California for a gallon is now $3.19 and may increase due to the after effects of Irma. But even with the gas price increase, some CSUN students say it doesn't have any effect on them. I pump gas maybe once every three weeks, so, you know, my car is kind of a gas saver, so I'm not really worried about it. You know, you got to do what you got to do. Some California residents say the price hike will influence them to conserve on gas and to use more public transportation. Most people try to just conserve when possible on that, but at the end of the day, you got to go where you got to go, and we're kind of subject to the prices of gas. The national average cost for gas is $2.67. The five cent increase was driven by the Gulf Coast refineries after Hurricane Harvey. In Northridge, I'm Chris Escobar, Valley View News. The destruction from Hurricane Irma left the island of Barbuda uninhabitable. Antigua and Barbuda ambassadors to the United States, Ronald Sanders, says it is humanitarian disaster. Sanders says for the first time in 300 years, there has not been a single person living in Barbuda. The government is focused on rebuilding and bringing back electricity and water to the island. A 94-year-old woman is suing the nursing home where eight people died after Hurricane Irma. Rosa Cabrera sustained heat-related injuries from the failure of the nursing home's air conditioning. She was later hospitalized. She was also told she wasn't going to be evacuated, but that she was safe and taken care of. Cabrera is a WMPT who can't walk or live independently. The firm representing the nursing home said it can't comment on the lawsuit. Most of the eight residents who died at the home were treated for dehydration, respiratory issues, and heat-related issues. Four Boston College students were attacked at a train station in France. Two were sent to the hospital and two were in shock. All victims were women identified themselves as juniors. Some of the ladies were in Paris studying abroad and one was studying at a business school in Denmark. The attacker was identified as a 41-year-old mentally unstable woman and was quickly arrested. Authorities have no information if the attack was terror-related. Facebook is still discovering whether pro-Kremlin groups bought ads to influence American politics. The unidentified ads may still exist on the social media network. The ads are through the company's self-service tool. It allows buyers to purchase and target ads. Once people hit the like button, ad buyers take the opportunity to target them and their friends. Facebook is continuing their investigation while working with federal authorities. Now to our newest segment in the show where we will keep track of the latest in social media. Shelby Charlene will be your social media maven. Shelby, what do you have for us today? Apple introduced three new iPhones last week. 
the 8, the 8 Plus, and the iPhone 10 in honor of the 10th anniversary since the original iPhone. All of them have some never before seen features. The biggest update, exclusive to the iPhone 10, is the facial recognition technology. They say it's a more convenient security feature, but many tech experts say the feature could compromise the security of your phone. They say the best way to secure your phone is to use a six digit passcode. All three new phones come with other features like a better camera, extra storage, faster processor, and new glass that's supposed to be the most durable glass ever in a smartphone. The iPhone also comes with a wireless charging feature. However, customers will have to buy their own wireless charging pads. Not to worry, all three phones are equipped with the USB charging port. The iPhone 8 and 8 Plus are set to release September 22nd. The iPhone 10 will be released November 3rd. You can pre-order in October. Facebook faced a controversial issue regarding anti-Semitic ad categories last week. The site's self-service ad manager was allowing advertisers to direct their promotions towards users who had interests like Jew haters and how to burn Jews. The anti-Semitic ad options weren't created by people, but by an algorithm. After becoming aware of this issue last week, Facebook removed the categories and is exploring different solutions to the problem. The site's considering limiting the number of categories of available or approving each category before making them available to ad buyers. In other Facebook news, the social site has introduced a new feature called the snooze button. If you've ever wanted to temporarily make someone's post disappear from your newsfeed, well, now you can. The new feature allows users to unfollow pages for 24 hours, 7 days, or even 30 days. The snooze button gives users more control over the content that appears on their news feeds without forcing them to permanently unfriend or unfollow pages or people. Facebook is currently testing the new feature on a selection of users. President Trump retweeted a video last Sunday morning that showed him hitting a golf ball that seemingly hits Hillary Clinton. The Twitter user who originally posted the edited video shared it with the caption, Donald Trump's amazing golf swing, with the hashtag Crooked Hillary. The footage of Hillary came from a 2011 video of Clinton falling as she boarded a plane. Reaction to the president's tweet has been divided. Some say the tweet is just a joke. However, two California congressmen denounced the president's actions on their own Twitter accounts. That's all I have for you today. Back to you. President Donald Trump attended his first United Nations General Assembly in New York. Leaders await to hear President Trump's approach to issues such as climate change and the Iran nuclear accord. His four-day schedule will be filled with one-on-one -on -one talks with eager counterparts to discuss these issues and the standoff with North Korea. President Trump says the UN has not reached its full potential and seeks a UN that can regain the trust of people around the world. This is the first chance leaders around the world get to judge President Trump and interact with him. Two people were arrested in connection with the bombing of an underground train station in London. The bombing injured 30 people when a device exploded during rush hour. A 21-year-old man and an 18-year-old man were arrested separately by British authorities. Both suspects were fostered by an elderly couple known for taking in refugees. This is the fifth terror attack in the United Kingdom this year. The UK lowered the threat level from critical to severe. After the break, updates on the death of Chicago teen Kanika Jenkins and a new bill involving sex offenders. Did you make the transfer to Hong Kong for the Emerson Project? I was just about to, but did you see the boss's email? It doesn't look right. It looked fine to me. I don't remember him mentioning the Emerson Project in our last week. The bank in Hong Kong closes in 15 minutes. Make the transfer. Yes, sir. Right on the way. Mr. Jacobs, just transferred the money for the Emerson Project. What Emerson Project? Don't be that guy. Trust, but verify. The family and friends of Kanika Jenkins, led by the victim's mother, Teresa Martin, are demanding that the FBI investigate further into her death. A group of people met in a park in Chicago to release balloons in Jenkins' honor. The group stormed into the FBI's Chicago office last Saturday for the Bureau to take on the case. Kanika Jenkins was found dead at the Crown Plaza Hotel's kitchen freezer Sunday, September 10th. Police released video of Jenkins stumbling through the hotel and eventually into the abandoned kitchen and towards the freezer. There is no video of Jenkins actually walking into the freezer. Those who showed up to the march suspect a cover-up. They want the Rosemont police to release the full tapes from the security footage, not just bits and pieces. 
Martin says that they will continue to protest until the FBI takes on the investigation. Governor Jerry Brown plans to sign a bill that doesn't require sex offenders to be permanently listed on the public registry. Lawmakers debated legislation before finally approving it. Los Angeles County District Attorney Jackie Lacey pushed for the change. She says the public registry is too big at 105,000 people. The registry needs to be smaller so law enforcement can solve sex offender crimes faster. The assembly vote was 42 to 22 with the most Republican voting against it. In 2021, offenders who committed nonviolent crimes or aren't expected to reoffend will only be on the list for 10 to 20 years. An ongoing outbreak of hepatitis A killed 16 people and hospitalized 292 others in San Diego County. Since November 2016, 421 people have been infected. Over 60 percent of those infected are homeless. A local public health emergency was issued on September 1st. Public health officials in San Diego installed hand wash stations where homeless residents gather. They also placed flyers in public areas to help spread awareness. California is officially a sanctuary state. The legislature passed by Kevin De Leon passed on a 27 to 11 vote in California's Senate. The bill aimed to limit state and local law enforcement communication with federal immigration authorities and prevent officers from questioning and holding people on immigration violations. Governor Brown and De Leon firmly negotiated until they agreed to a compromise at two in the morning. De Leon says the measure protects the hardworking people that contribute to society and shows what the state of California is all about. Many people in need of interpreters at LA courts are not getting the help they need. Valley View News reporter Jose Duran has more. California courthouses continue to face a shortage of interpreters. This is a problem for millions of Californians who don't feel comfortable communicating in English. So Ela Hernandez, who came to LA from Mexico 16 years ago, says this makes people afraid to go to court. I know people who have been unable to get interpreters, she says. They don't go to court because they're scared, they can't speak English, and they can't get help. More than 200 languages are spoken in California. Having qualified interpreters for all of them is a challenge for the state's court system, which is believed to be the largest in the country. However, Danny Chen says having access to interpreters is necessary. The last thing I would want is for my parents to be up there, you know, being accused of something and not being able to give them the opportunity to have a fair trial due to the lack of understanding. California has invested more than $7 million during the past year to increase the number of qualified court interpreters. The specific language needs vary by location. But in L.A., interpreters are needed in Spanish, Korean, and numerous other languages, including American Sign. Colleges should offer programs in all the languages that are spoken in the country, she says. This is a big country and communities have people from all over. Because federal authorities and court officials have worked together to bring more interpreters to L.A., it is now the best court system in the state. However, many community members say more needs to be done. In L.A., for Valley View News, I'm Jose Duran. Now to Star Harvey with the latest in entertainment news. Hi, Star. Hi, Dahlia. Last Sunday, the 69th Annual Emmy Awards put diversity on full display. Female-focused shows were some of the night's biggest winners. And the Emmy goes to The Handmaid's Tale! The Handmaid's Tale, directed by Reed Moreno, won eight Emmys. It also made history. The show took the award for Outstanding Drama Series. That's the first time the streaming service Hulu won the best series. The HBO series Big Little Lies was another big winner, bringing in eight Emmys. Part of the cast features Nicole Kidman, Laura Dern, and Reese Witherspoon. Their biggest award was for Outstanding Limited Series. Some of the other winners who made history include Lena Waithe. The actress is the first black woman to receive a nomination and win for Best Writing for a Comedy Series. Waith co-wrote and starred alongside actor Aziz Osari in the Netflix series Master of None. The two received a standing ovation after Waith gave a shout out to her LGBTQIA family in her acceptance speech. Donald Glover took home two awards, also making history. His first show, Atlanta, won for outstanding directing of a series comedy. Glover is the first black director to win. Glover also took home the trophy for lead actor in a comedy series. Actress Selena Gomez revealed on Instagram last week that she had a kidney transplant. 
She got the kidney transplant from fellow actress and friend Francie Eresa. Gomez posted a photo showing the two of them holding hands across their hospital beds. Reza is best known for her TV series, The Secret Life of the American Teenager. Gomez said Reza gave her the ultimate gift by donating her kidney. Two years ago, the star said that she had the autoimmune disease lupus. Gomez says she'll soon share more about the transplant with her fans. The controversy about ESPN and host Jamil Hill and her comments about President Trump continue. Hill tweeted last week that Trump is, quote, a white supremacist who largely surrounded himself with other white supremacists. Trump responded to Hill's tweet demanding an apology. White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders spoke about the tweets. Uh, I think the point is that ESPN uh, has been hypocritical. They should hold anchors to a fair and consistent standard. ESPN suspended a longtime anchor, Linda Cohn, uh, not too long ago for expressing a political viewpoint. The network's public editor has said that there is a perception that ESPN has become political and that has harmed the network. This is clearly a political statement. They should be consistent uh, in whatever uh, guidelines that they have set themselves in, in that front. Some labor lawyers say ESPN can't legally fire Hill. Hill later apologized for her tweet. She said she put ESPN in an unfair light. She stands by her comments and the president, she refuses to apologize to him. The network says Hill's comments do not represent the position of ESPN. Cardi B's first charting single, Bodak Yellow, is number two on the Billboard Top 100. Bodak Yellow only took six weeks to reach that point. Cardi B's single could possibly bump Taylor Swift out of the number one spot. Swift's single, Look What You Made Me Do, has been number one for three weeks. If Bodak Yellow takes the number one spot, she would be the first female rapper since Lauryn Hill to hit the number one without a feature. That's it for entertainment news. Now back to you. Trump made a comment about Korean dictator Kim Jong-un. And a fire broke out in a Malaysian school. More details after the break. Uh, Miss Stevens, I just wiped malware off our system. Uh, people have got to stop clicking unsolicited email links and downloading free software unless it's from a trusted source. Sounds great. We need a data backup plan in a separate location in case we get hacked. We need to focus on making profits, not spending them. Learn to protect yourself from ransomware. If you become a victim, contact your local FBI office. You made this vacation happen. Cleverly merging promotions. Double points with every purchase. And cross-referencing travel sites. <laughs> Aloha. If you can ace your vacation, you can do it for retirement. Get on track with tips at aceyourretirement.org. President Donald Trump has a new name for North Korean President Kim Jong-un. Trump posted a tweet naming Kim Rocket Man. Kim conducted six nuclear bomb tests and several intercontinental missile launches. If the United States has to defend itself or defend its allies in any way, North Korea will be destroyed. And we all know that. And none of us want that. Trump threatened Kim about his pursuit of a nuclear arsenal in violation of international rule. The UN Security Council imposed more sanctions earlier this month, including cutting off petroleum supplies. Trump tried to get allies to pressure Kim into ending his pursuit of a nuclear weapon. Seven people have been arrested in a connection to a fire at a school in Malaysia. The fire killed 21 students and two adults. Kuala Lumpur's police chief says the suspects are school dropouts. All of the suspects are between the ages of 11 and 18. According to the Deputy Inspector General of Police, the school's license was under review and should have been closed. Officials say the investigation of the cause of the fire is ongoing. Marijuana will soon be legal in California, but State Assemblyman Rudy Salas introduced a bill to stop the selling of the cannabis candies. Lawmakers say that edible candy can be mistaken for real candy, which is a hazard for children. Edibles are very popular amongst medical marijuana users and are used as medication. As dispensary owners says a better solution would be to make child-proof packaging. The bill passed last Thursday and has been sent to Governor Jerry Brown. 
With the legalization of marijuana in California around the corner, lawmakers proposed that growers and sellers would be able to do business together. The new change would allow licensed medical marijuana sellers to also grow and sell medicinal cannabis. The measure will allow medical cannabis vendors to sell to non-medical patients. Lawmakers say the changes will allow the marijuana vendors to be more convenient for cannabis consumers. Organizations in L.A. are doing their part to keep former inmates from returning to prison. Valley View News reporter Lauren Turner Dunn has more. More than 2.3 million people in the U.S. are in jail or prison. The Anti-Recidivism Coalition in L.A. is a support network for formerly incarcerated men and women. Adrian Vasquez is a job developer intake specialist at the ARC. He understands the lack of resources and wants inmates to pursue higher education. While incarcerated, I personally took correspondence courses from Coastline Communities. What I like to see with them inside is continue that pathway, taking trades and rehabilitative programs. The U.S. Sentencing Commission found nearly half of former inmates go back to jail for another offense or for a violation of their parole. Husband and father Larry Butler started his own business. After serving nine years, he says inmates need to be prepared for re-entry. Just like they were so quick to throw us in there, they should have been quick to prepare us mentally for the streets. Homeboy Industries in L.A. gives gang-involved men and women free services. Member Ruth Butler plans on becoming an OBGYN. For her, Homeboy Industries is a place to ask for help. We have assistance with uh, counselors, case management. Sometimes you just need to like relax your mind and ex express how you feel and they give you that like you're able to come and talk. Homeboy Industries offers tours and Carlos Caballeros is comfortable guiding visitors. He questions where he would be without Homeboy Industries. Would I still be out, you know, selling drugs as I used to? Would I uh, end up in prison or even worse, you know, would I end up dead? Homeboy Industries and the Anti-Recidivism Coalition help those who are ready by providing tattoo removal services, general education classes, and jobs. In Los Angeles, this is Lauren Turner Dunn. Now to Maybelline Kapaloo in the newsroom with student reactions on the Clay Travis story. Fox Radio host Clay Travis says he believes in the First Amendment and boobs. Last week on CNN, this outraged show host, Brooke Baldwin, who then kicked him off air, he was invited to discuss if ESPN acted appropriately in regards to Jamel Hill. Travis received backlash and support on social media after the live show. Students at CSUN shared their opinions on the issue. Uh, no, I don't. I don't feel like anyone should lose their job based on what they say or what they do. Everyone's entitled to have an opinion. I kind of think it's like inappropriate for on-air stuff, but at the same time, like CNN's asking people different beliefs. The First Amendment protects you from the government, but not from employers. Political science professor Nicholas Dungy talks about how the media is a private industry. In private industry, you, there is no constitutional protection um, to free speech. In other words, the First Amendment does not protect you from losing your job. Travis said he will make t-shirts quoting, I love the First Amendment and boobs and the proceeds will go to breast cancer awareness. Back to you in the studio. Now to our sportsman, Daniel Martindale. What do you have today? Hey, thanks, Amber. And boy, was it a rough weekend for LA sports. Let's get right to it. Well, our football team sure put the L in LA on Sunday. For the first time in more than 20 years, we had two NFL teams in action at the exact same time, and they both didn't fare so well. The Chargers played a home game in Los Angeles for the first time since 1960. They officially returned home by kicking off at a soccer stadium. They played their first home game of the season against the Miami Dolphins at the StubHub Center in Carson. And it turns out the Chargers took something with them from San Diego, losing. They lost their seventh straight game dating back to last season by a final of 1917. Veteran quarterback Phillip Rivers was flowing all day for L.A. He completed 31 of 39 passes for more than 300 yards. His one touchdown pass was to tight end Antonio Gates, and that catch allowed him to pass through the gates of football immortality. His 112th career touchdown catch broke the record for most touchdown catches by a tight end ever. Dolphins kicker Cody Parkey gave his team a late game lead with a 54-yard field goal, but the Chargers drove all the way back with only a minute left. They put themselves in position for a game-winning kick. Kicker Yang Wei Koo had a shot at redemption after missing a game-tying kick last week in Denver, and this time around, 
he missed again. The Chargers and Koo are now 0-2. And another last-second letdown for the Bolts is anything but a surprise. The Chargers have lost their last 11 one-possession games. They're home to the Chiefs on Sunday. The Rams also lost the tight game to Washington. Back to the Dolphins now in a bizarre story that unfolded before the game even began. One of Miami's top linebackers went MIA. Lawrence Timmons was nowhere to be found before yesterday's game. He eventually turned up but missed his first ever start in 10 pro seasons. Head coach Adam Gase refused to comment on the situation, but he says the absence is not life-threatening or criminal-related. Teammates say he seemed fine all week until he disappeared from the team hotel on Saturday night. The team even filed a missing persons report. The Dolphins, of course, have spent the last 10 days practicing down the road in Oxnard because of Hurricane Irma. Well, the son of former Penn State football coach Jerry Sandusky has pleaded guilty to child sex abuse. 41-year-old Jeffrey Sandusky admitted to all 14 counts against him. This happened in a Pennsylvania courtroom last Friday. Sandusky is charged with soliciting sex from a minor and soliciting child pornography. The counts stem from text messages to two girls. Sandusky is now a Tier 3 sex offender and could serve up to eight years in state prison. Well, USC had more than 84,000 on hand for last Saturday's thriller against Texas. That crowd heavily outdrew the attendance of both of L.A.'s new pro football teams. Well, student athletes at universities across L.A. are expected to excel in competition and in the classroom. Valley View News reporter Malcolm Finney has that story. Malcolm? The son of Viltz was one of the top high school prospects in track and field in 2014. While at Long Beach Millican High School, he was one of the top high school hurdles in the nation and had a 3.9 GPA. That led to Viltz being recruited by UCLA. Built says grades was a big part of his recruitment. First they ask you like um, for your transcript and they ask you um, SAT scores and if not SAT then um, ACT or both if you have them. Uh, yeah, and they want to make sure that you have something above a 3.0 for sure. NCAA athletes have a standard to uphold. Athletes often have more classes than regular students. They are also held to a higher academic grade point average than other students. CSUN Senior Athletic Director Tiana Jones talks about relationships between student athletes and counselors. Our job is to make sure that the student athletes are meeting what's called progress towards degree. So they're benchmarks that are set by the NCAA in order for the student athletes to be eligible from one semester to the next and from one year to the next. And that actually starts prior to them coming. CSUN women's basketball player Serafina Malupe has been on the team for three years. She says that the counselors at CSUN have gone beyond her expectations and have been very helpful with her academic process. You know, whenever I need anything, they're always there to help me and always willing to help. So, yes, I am very satisfied. From university to university, a better future for the athletes is the goal. Athletes are expected to hit the classroom as they would their sport. In Northridge, I'm Malcolm Finney. All right, thank you, Malcolm. That's all we have for sports this week. Back to you guys. Crayola has a new color. Beautiful is replacing the dandelion color in its 24-pack box. It is Crayola's 19th blue color and won 40% of the vote in an online contest. Critics on Twitter say Beautiful is teaching kids a non-word and color name. One user says the name is playing part in the dumbing down of America. Other users came to the defense of the name, calling it creative. One user said it allows kids to discuss language use in creating brands and products. We know you have many options for news, so thank you for watching. For Valley View News, I'm Dahlia Perez. And I'm Amber Partita. See you next time.